Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. This is Parallel Session 1C, What Does Two-Way Communication Look Like for Basic Science? And um, there's an idea that one of the ways to engage the public in science in a powerful and effective way is an engagement that is two-way, that's less about outreach or the one-way delivery of information, and more about conversation or the back and forth of ideas and information where non-scientists are as active as scientists. Uh, this can take a lot of forms. We heard about some of them in the plenary, including public participation in scientific research or citizen science, when um, non-scientists participate in doing science, maybe taking measurements, maybe helping analyze data, co-created science, where non-scientists have a role in the actual design of the scientific research, co-production of knowledge, which is a lot like co-created science, but perhaps more explicitly tied to the use of science, uh, the application of science and deliberative dialogues where people from a variety of backgrounds debate policy about science, what research to advance, for example, or certain research topics should be off limits. Um, and yet in all of this, there's this kind of idea that, that, that maybe these two-way approaches are a little bit harder to do or less appropriate or maybe even less relevant when it comes to basic science. Or maybe even that the very idea of basic and applied science isn't as helpful when it comes to thinking about bi-directional engagement. We want to explore all these ideas in this session and provide you all with tips and ideas you can try out if you want to adopt two-way communication strategies. And we'd like to kind of have this session be two-way. So if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have things you'd like to share, please use the Q&A section of the interface. Um, that works a little bit easier for us to see than the chat section. So if you could use the Q&A, that would be helpful. We've got great panelists. I had the chance to spend a little time with them before this panel. and. It, you're in for a treat. Um, they're insightful, they're thoughtful, they've got a lot to say, um, and, and so I'm really pleased to introduce them. Our first panelist is Greg Bowman, who's an associate professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Second panelist is Yvette Abdullah Madno, who's the director of outreach, education, and engagement at the Simmons Foundation. And our third panelist is Sarah Garlick the Director of Policy and Outreach at the Hubbard Brooks Research Foundation. So let's jump right in. Um, I'd like to ask each of you to kind of introduce yourself and help ground us in what we're talking about um, when we talk about two-way communication. So can you give us a concrete example of a two-way communication practice or approach that you've been involved with? And I'll start with you, Craig, if I could, please. Sure, yeah, happy to be here and chat with everyone. Uh, so I serve as the director of a distributed computing project called Folding at Home, and we sort of have two parallel missions. On the science side, we're trying to use computer simulations to understand the molecular mechanisms of biology. Uh, but, but sort of adjacent and uh, very synergistic with this, we're also empowering anyone with a computer and an internet connection to actually join us and take part in the research by volunteering their computing power to use for this research. And one of the really exciting things that's come out of this is sort of a community that's grown up around this work that brings together scientists and uh, people from the public who are all you know, actively engaged in driving this endeavor. Be over to you, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. Um, so I work for the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation, and we are a nonprofit support arm for the long-term Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study, which is at a USDA experimental forest in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And, um, and so a lot of my work involves um, developing mechanisms for scientists to communicate and listen to and learn from different community groups, stakeholder groups, and decision makers. And one of the ways I do this, um, I convene a lot of roundtable dialogue programs. And so these are facilitated dialogue programs with invited participants to explore issues um, of mutual interest among the scientific community and different community groups um, and stakeholder groups and decision makers. Uh, and so within those, those facilitated days, we see a lot of multi-directional communication and learning. Um, and so I'm excited to share some of that in the conversation today. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yvette? Um, hi, thanks so much for inviting me to the conversation. It's great um, to be here. So as you could probably tell, I'm not from here. I'm new to the US. I've, I've just started at the Simons Foundation, which is um, 
a private foundation that funds transformational research across uh, basic sciences. And I lead the outreach uh, portfolio, which includes a lot of really interesting uh, projects and initiatives, including our flagship Catalyst Grant um, mechanism, which is called Science Sandbox. Um, but before that, I suppose, Raj, you were asking to share a an approach or a, a project. I, I wanted to share an approach with you from the organization I was at before, so the British Science Association. And I think one of the things that we came across with two-way engagement was really trying to understand where the audience was and rather than what the scientists wanted to do or say in that communication piece. So we had to start from the beginning and really think about, okay, let's create a space that allows the community to come in, feel as if they have ownership and permission to operate in these spaces. And then, um, you know, we gave out micro grants, we built up a leadership program. And only then, really a couple of years later, did we invite the scientists into those spaces. And we're like, now we're ready because we've done the groundwork and, you know, it was work. Um, to build build up that so that people are almost level pegging field, uh, level playing field when it comes to that communication piece. Uh, so yeah, we can dig into that a bit more, but just wanted to share that. To yeah, start with. Thank you. That's a nice place to start. Um, so the idea is that before you can have that two-way communication, you need to kind of level the playing field a little bit and create a place where people feel comfortable. Sarah, I saw you nodding. What do you want to add to that? Um, Let's see. I think I think there's there's listening and leveling the playing field, and there's also being honest about what your objectives are, what your goals are for for two way communication and engagement, and and you know being clear about that, and also being open to having your your uh, your mind changed about that. So part of listening is being open to changing your own mind, right? Um, so I think in our case, it happened. Uh, a lot of our, our initial goals are about wanting to be seen and used by community members as resources. When people have questions, when people are facing issues, we want them to turn to our scientific community and know that we're here. Um, but also, uh, you know, going that, that means being able to share our, our science and listen to what's, um, what's relevant and what's useful. So I, I, think, I think there's just this interplay of, of knowing what you're trying to achieve, being open to changing your mind, and and um, yeah, navigating that I think is really interesting. Thanks, Greg. I'm curious how that happens in an online environment, like what you're doing. We've got a, a couple avenues that have been really successful. Um, you know, I think one of the the really cool things that we've uh, done almost serendipitously has given people uh, a platform to build on and you know welcome them to come and play uh, and and learn so so we have some you know traditional communication where we write blog posts about the science that we're doing uh, but then we've also provided a discord server where people can talk with each other and this is you know scientists with people from the public but also amongst people in the public and so they uh, and then, and the other thing we've given them just as an example is that we, you know, give people points in uh, proportion to their contribution to the project. And these are, you know, publicly visible and you can see leaderboards. Uh, and with these two things, people have really taken off. So, you know, people will do in-depth analyses of what hardware you should buy to maximize your points per day and share that with people and debate the relative merits of different hardware. Uh, you know, they'll engage with the science and talk about what what the you know visualizations of our data that they can see on their screens mean and really try to understand. And others have gone off and done things that we completely didn't expect, like they've created cryptocurrencies that reward people in proportion to the points that they earn, which you know is uh, brings a whole new aspect and has drawn a lot of other volunteers into the project. Um, and so it's sort of you know, making people welcome and giving them something to chew on has really created the snowballing effect. Got it. So you all emphasized openness, but that means things might go in a direction different than you intend. What do you do? And this is a question from the audience. What happens when the audience wants something different than the scientists who are doing the engagement? I think that's why it's so important, like Sarah alluded to, to being really clear about your agenda and what you have that you can give. 
um, often we've all heard like we want to get new audiences but we never consider what we have to give as an organization or as an individual and I think if we're upfront about that and saying this is what we're here for is it what you need or want or are interested in I think it kind of helps with those difficulties that might come later down the road when you haven't been clear maybe even with yourself about why you're doing this kind of know yourself before you can share. Greg? Yeah, I think it you know involves a commitment to spending time as one of the like maybe costs that people don't uh, realize at, at first is that, you know, you don't just get to like tell people what you want them to know and they smile and nod and, and accept it. You know, they might come back with more questions or, you know, ask why you don't go in a different direction and, uh, you, know, you have to be prepared to engage with them like a colleague to, you know, uh, you know, argue your point or adapt. Uh, so, you know, like just kind of a, a funny story from my university that had a donor that really wanted to invest in ESP research. Right. And, uh, you know, this was a little out there from the university's leadership perspective. And, you know, it took time to say, OK, you know, we're going to engage and try to understand what it is you're really interested in and how we can you know, come to some agreement on a, you know, synergistic direction and they you know, got the donor excited about, you know, neuroscience and what could be done there. Right. And I think we've seen parallel things with folding at home where sometimes people have really great ideas that we didn't think of, you know, sometimes it takes a little effort to see what they were getting at and, you know, how we can put ourselves on a shared path. Sarah. Thanks. I want to jump in because I, I think the question that Erica asked in the Q&A is super important and because um, it gets to attention in, in this work in practice. And so I work in the in environmental sciences and, and the, the ecosystem study that, I, that I'm part of is a, is a fundamental basic ecosystem study. And we engage with different audiences about um, about some of these topics. And a lot of community members are like, yeah, like they want they have they have problems they want solved. They want they have environmental problems they want solved, whether they're local or global. And um, and sometimes a, a basic research study doesn't have those those solutions ready at the fingertips. And so we have to 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 negotiate that space, which can be challenging. Sometimes it means um, finding other experts who can help address those problems and being kind of a matchmaker or facilitator. Um, sometimes it means um, trying to draw different applied threads when we can. Sometimes it means listening and, and elevating those, those concerns when we have those platforms. Um, but I also, the other kind of awesome thing about working in, in a long-term ecological research site is it's long-term. And so I come from the perspective that, that these interactions over the long term will will tighten that those gaps between those community interests and what the scientists are thinking about. Um, so. so you've started to answer this question, Sarah, that just came in, which was what do you do um, when the question from Shoba, what, what do you what happens? Um, how do you address community concerns that aren't within your particular research agenda or your institution's research agenda? You gave some tips, connect with other places, develop that long-term relationship. What other tips would you have for folks with that question? Um, I suppose I would jump in with probably seeing it not just about knowledge and understanding. I think, you know, we've gone on about this before in our chat uh, prior, but I think often people assume that science is just a body of like of facts and or it's a career but actually it's a mindset and helping scientists really connect with the skills they have as scientists not just the knowledge that they hold um, can sometimes help so when we're thinking about um, communities that want to solve their own problems within their community actually science can help address those things there's a couple of um, nice examples something called access lab which you can um, google and check out uh, where we connect scientists with um, members of the community that have issues that they want to solve not using scientific knowledge as such but you know how you interrogate data how you look for evidence and, and validate it and things like that that can sometimes help when people come at science and like what about this and tell us this information um helping people uncover it for themselves harking back to that idea that Bruce introduced in the plenary that science is a process as much as a 
body of knowledge, the process can be useful, even if the particular body of knowledge you hold as a scientist isn't as useful. Yeah, and I think connecting, you know, what you're actually doing with what it is people people want is highly valuable. You know, so well, we'll have people that will say like, well, you know, we'd love to see Alzheimer's disease cured also, and we know that you're working on this, but why aren't you doing more actual drug design to like put something in the clinic? And then, you know, we can come back and explain like, oh, well, we'd, we'd love to, and we're working towards that. But before we can design drugs, we have to know what the targets are and some, enough about how they work that we know what we want to do to them. And so we're doing things like trying to understand how changing one little chemical component of a protein called APOE, uh, you know, one out of 300 pieces uh, increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease by like 15 fold, right? And if we can understand that, and if you want to help us with that, then we can move on to starting to think about drug design, but we just don't know what to hit yet, right? And most people, you know, given given that information, will sort of update what they want and, and we'll get on board with it. And, you know, maybe a few really are interested in helping with drug design research and might shift their attention to another uh, project and that that's great too. Um, so you do have to like hold your ground a little bit and what's what's realistic for you to do. And um, uh, but but mostly people are are on board with uh, you know, given enough information working with you. There's a there's an undercurrent here that I just want to call out of of kind of mutual respect of treating people as colleagues and sort of having the honest conversation about the overlap of your interests and their interests and being really intentional with that. Can I jump in with one? Please. I had an idea that came to me as another approach that when we think about public engagement with science, instead of as a discrete activity, but as developing meaningful relationships over time, then, then that's where solutions start to emerge in ways that we can't anticipate. So, so you know, as we've held our round tables or we've had our pub nights or we've engaged in different ways in our communities and in our in our region, the relationships that get established then then start, you know, churning that those those results or those solutions. So we would have a community group say, oh, you know, we're having an issue with groundwater in our town. I remember going to that round table and meeting some of those scientists. I wonder if they could could come to our community group and talk to us. And so those are those unexpected or unanticipated connections that I think have longer term meaning and impact. I love that. It sort yeah. of, go ahead, Yvette. Oh, no, I, I agree. And I think that that's, as you were speaking, I was like, well, yeah, because that's, we never really talk about whether we're trying to communicate, or whether we're actually trying to engage. And the example I always use is when it's engagement, someone's going to pick up the phone whenever they want and disturb you during your day when you're doing your science you know, disturb in the best possible way, but they'll ask you something because that relationship is there and it exists. Whereas when you're just communicating, you know, I love watching a great movie and I don't want to be involved in the creative process. I don't want anyone, to, I don't want to co-create it with anybody. I want it to be presented to me, right? But some things I do want to be involved in. So it's just finding that balance for, for basic science and it differs. It, it's almost like we're saying, two-way engagement is a process and maybe communication is a, is a thing. Um, Greg, you started to touch on this a little bit, but Naomi asked a question, um, which was an example of how two-way engagement has translated into changes in the research practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I'd like to open that question up to everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh... You know, we've we've really gotten a lot of uh, input from from our users. A lot of them are very tech savvy, for example, and will point out opportunities that that maybe uh, we didn't see before they did. You know, uh, point out that there's new devices coming out that we can should consider. You know, being compatible with or you know, contribute things like uh, like I mentioned, starting these cryptocurrencies that becomes a new draw for people to participate in the the project. Um, and, and so, you know, this kind of connects with this theme about, uh, you know, engaging in mutual respect is that, you know, I, I tweet a bunch of ideas, but then I also want you know, spend time watching how people respond and uh, uh, listening to what their thoughts are. Uh, and, you know, what what sort of, you know, personal stories they might bring in, hey, you know, my, 
my grandmother got Alzheimer's and such and such protein was involved. Have you considered looking into that? And that's you know, sometimes spurred people to go read new areas of the literature and uh, start a new project. I, I have an example of, of um, engagement leading to new research. And, and it's also an example of, of one-way communication influencing two-way communication influencing basic and applied research. So we had a um, an ice storm experiment at Hubbard Brook. So this was a um, the first of its kind um, human created ice storm to, to ask basic questions about the impact of these disturbances on the forest ecosystem. And it was a really exciting experiment. They, they used, um, you know, fire hoses to spray the forest down in the middle of winter overnight. And so we did a lot of one-way communication with the media. We had video. It was just this visually really exciting experiment. Because of that one-way communication, because of the media uptake of the experiment, we heard from the Coco Ross folks. This is a community um, weather a group of weather observers around the world that they were having a hard time um, with a protocol for measuring ice accretion in their backyard weather observers. So then we were able to co-create with them a, a basic experiment to try out different types of, of collectors for, for ice accretion in backyard. We published that and then we, we shared that out. So it was this really neat, you know, again, cascade effect. And you're not really sure where it's going, but by putting yourself out there, um, there's just these really wonderful, meaningful outcomes. Thanks. Thank you. Cool example. Um, I'm going to combine two questions from Srikanth and Bradley. And the question is sort of how and where do you begin setting up this two-way communication as an individual? And, and maybe especially if you're early in your science career, how do you do it given kind of how much time it takes? Um, I'm happy to jump in uh, first. So on an individual level, I suppose I'd just really reflect on, you know, what community are you part of? Um, that could be a local one. Maybe there's, um, you know, your local town or city. Um, perhaps you identify different um, ways, like, can you lean into that? And actually you have a community around you that you can start with and that still counts, um, you know, and before you start thinking really big about, I want to go and work with this, community over here that you have no um, relationship with or, or you haven't built that trust with. So I think I would start off with practicing and starting with what's around you and building out that way. You'll learn so much just from, um, from taking that approach. Thanks. Start local. Sarah or Greg, any tips? I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting tools now for starting to do this on different scales, right? So you know, if people want to engage, I think, you know, Twitter, for example, is a really great platform where it's easy to start sharing about what you're doing and uh, see, see who responds to you and engage with them and build from there. Um, so I think those are things that are accessible to anyone and, and something that I think is applicable to a subset of us is, you know, like with our work, you don't need to know anything about, you know, deep about the biology or the chemistry or the physics to participate, right? Because this is all in the software that people can run. Uh, and so I think those are interesting opportunities to, to look out for are, are, you know, what are the things that people could contribute without having to do a PhD first, for example. Sarah. I, I love the idea of of starting in your own community. And I, I would say, you know, wear your scientist hat in your community. It's okay to like be a scientist in your community, join a nonprofit board, you know, get involved in a local community group and wear your scientist hat. I think that's a way to, to begin. And then the second piece to that is to, is to start listening and to build in time for listening. So if you're invited to give a talk at a school, um, build in some time before and after to, to talk to the teachers, to talk to the students, to build in time for Q&A, to have informal conversation time. That Those opportunities that are intentional for listening to what people are interested in, to what they're caring about, um, is really the, the key to start this process. So this is a question kind of combining a question from Rick and Andrea. Like all of these examples, like all of this is a little bit of seeding power a little bit of being a little bit less in the driver's seat than maybe traditionally science outreach is. How have you 
come to terms with that? And how do you help your colleagues come to terms with that? My personal experience has been that there's been so much return on investment from taking the time to do this that it's, you know, well worth it. So, so just one example, early in the pandemic, we launched some simulations of one of the proteins from the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, that was of particular interest uh, to us. And of course, we were motivated to, you know, pivot some of the, the research we were doing on other viruses to, to tackle the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I took... I took a couple hours away from the, the work and wrote a blog post about it, uh, as did one or two of my other colleagues. And, and, you know, those couple of hours exploded. We had like a hundred fold growth in the project over the next couple of months because, uh, you know, maybe unsurprisingly in retrospect, people were really eager to have something to do about the pandemic and not just hunker at home waiting helplessly to see what happened and trying to uh, evade it. Right. So so at the beginning, you know, what looked like a distraction from really important work where, you know, an, an hour couldn't be spared. Uh, we got way more done because suddenly we could do all the proteins from the virus, not just the, the one that we had picked as being particularly uh, interesting and, and uh, uh, addressable, given where we were at before we started engaging people in what we were doing. I love that example. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of it is longer term, though, right? Is, uh, you know, we, we are dependent on Congress continuing to approve budgets for NIH and NSF and other research things. So, you know, some of the benefits are longer term. And, you know, most of my blog posts do not evoke hundredfold growth in the project, but uh, I think they do build uh, interest in and support for science that is, you know, necessary for us to keep doing what we're doing in the long term. I also think the question about managing power dynamics and being open to those changing. I mean, it's hard to talk about this in abstract, but I'll try. I, I think I find a lot of openness and a lot of interest among our scientists in in doing this work. So I, I find there's not a lot of concern about that. But I also think there are those of us who play the sometimes invisible practitioner role of managing all of that and and uh, you know setting up this the room so that the power dynamics so that you're kind of flattening the power structures and you know setting up the agenda so that people feel included i, I mean all of that takes um that boundary work takes a lot of attention and it takes a, a profession and so i think that's one way of managing that tension is to make sure that you have some of those experts who are who are qualified or, or have um, experience doing that over time, you know, working in that role. I agree. And I think the onus is on us as public engagement experts or specialists or, you know, people that are working in this field to really think about the way we're framing that that whole experience because we often you know when we've all called a scientist like will you be involved in my project they immediately assume they're going to come as the person that's going to stand on stage give a talk be funny like you know be the presenter whereas what we're asking them more often again in, in my previous role was actually just come to the conversation as you and um, we're going to help you build a relationship with someone who lives in the same town as you uh, with no again agenda as such it's just have a conversation see if you have anything that you align on right sometimes you're going to meet people and you're going to have nothing in common you'll have nothing that you want to solve together or do together but if you're thinking about these long-term relationships by spending time with people as we build all relationships you you begin to find that common ground and that's where you get i think you build really exciting programs and projects so how can we allow that to happen more in our sector, I think, um, and give people that freedom and the ability to take those risks where there may not be a set of objectives that they can hand in at the end of the report. Maybe they didn't achieve anything, but they built a relationship or they tried. So maybe it's about us changing. Thanks. We talked kind of building on that theme of changing in our like in our warm up conversation. You guys had a lot to say about this distinction between basic and applied science. Would you share some of that thinking? 
I think I, I started off and it was nice to hear the plenary this morning because I wasn't sure where my work and long-term ecological research fit in that, in that dichotomy, because um, we do do, you know, discovery driven, curiosity driven, basic research about e ecosystems. And yet there are often tendrils that are applied or, um, or, or there's complementary research that's applied. And so I, I wasn't sure if I, where my work fit in this conference, but now I'm feeling a little bit more secure in that. <laughs> um, and, and the, the other thing I would, I would say, the, one of the, the things that we've seen at, in our work is that sometimes we'll, we'll engage with say, um, conservation groups or community groups about what's happening in the experimental forest. And then we've had, you know, partners like land managers call us and say, well, we, we have this other problem in our forest. We wanted to know if you could help. And even though they were different questions, they were applied questions in different contexts, some of our scientists were able to take their approaches and bring them over to other contexts and, and use them in an applied context. And so those are questions that they might not have asked in the, the, the long-term ecosystem study, but they're happy to spend some time and resources to help a community group. Um, and I suspect that over time we'll see new insights arise because of that openness, but and I think for some members of the public, and I suppose myself included, if I think about my family and like my friends, they don't make a distinction between, you're all scientists, right? Like I talk to people about what I do and I'm like, oh, it's all science. Um, they wouldn't know if you were gonna, I'm a computational mathematician or I build bridges. It does, it's all the same um, to a lot of the public. So I think bearing that in mind is important too. Thanks. You know, I think there's a spectrum, right? And that bridging, uh, bridging across or throughout that can be really high value. You know, so, so in our work, you know, I think most everyone is interested in there being drugs for Alzheimer's disease, right? Uh, and it's easy to go from there to like, oh, well, you know, if we want to get there, it would help a lot if we understand how this protein APOE works and people can get excited about that. And, you know, then from there we can go and remind them, well, the only reason we're able to, to do that is because we spent uh, a couple decades working on this problem that you may have never hold up, heard of called, you know, protein folding, which is just you know, understanding how these molecular machines like APOE, you know, build themselves so that they're prepared to perform some, some function. And it was like, oh, okay, like I can see, like I want that Alzheimer's drug and I definitely want to understand the targets and, and you know, doing these basic, you know, more curiosity driven things can uh, lay the foundation for that. Um, I want to ask a question from Sarah. Um, she's asking about how Western science traditions engage with indigenous knowledges and how that's changed over time and, and really looking maybe to talk about how valuable those knowledge systems are, how they're sometimes still dismissed or disregarded and how we can start to change that? Yeah, it's a really important question in, in ecology and in, in our, um, in lots of different contexts. So um, I don't have a, a, a single answer to that. I can say that it's it's a topic. I love, there's a group in, in, in Maine, so across the border from where I live, uh, that it's a group of conservation groups, some scientific groups, but they're kind of gathered together to engage with tribal nations in the Northeast. And I love their tagline is that um, we're proceeding um, at the pace of trust. And I think that as that's a really, like I just always hold on to that in, in all of the work. But I, I think that when we're thinking about incorporating indigenous knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge into our long-term ecosystem studies, um, and we're talking about engagement with tribal nations, sovereign nations, um, that it's important to proceed at the pace of trust and, and think about what that means for our organizations and our and our efforts. So um, that's a really big question and I don't have a short answer, but it's, a, it's an important one that we're definitely grappling with. I think it's incumbent upon us in all these efforts to, to sort of recognize that there has been a history of dispossession and, and disenfranchisement in science and one of the things we can think about as a science community is how we can start to repair that and how we can sort of leverage our work. That actually 
takes us right into a question from Nancy, kind of a nuts and bolts question. How do you ensure that the community you're working with, you're bringing in, are actually representative of the broader community and aren't just the people who have the time or the resources? What are some, how would you, how would you answer that question? I think that's part of the work, going out and finding the right people um, and also knowing that we're not always the right people to do that work. You know, there's other people that are better placed, of course, that have the trust with communities and have those relationships already and how can we help them to do their work better um yeah i, I completely agree is that we shouldn't just be I know this is an issue that happens in some other some research areas where a lot of the research is struck is built around um you know women who have time to contribute to studies because um for whatever reason and so yeah tr trying to be aware of that is important i can't give any concrete um advice i think it's case by case but. and you know because we do hold these roundtable events where we invite people in it's something we think a lot about and we, we talk a lot about and we try things out so um depending on the the goal and the objectives of the actual roundtable that can help set kind of which community groups or stakeholder networks we're thinking about inviting because there, there might be a, a particular goal um, but yeah, who can come? Who can who can drive to our experimental forest? We do, you know, provide resources. But in, who can take off a, a work day? All of those questions um, really matter. How the room is set up. All so, so. One of the things about the pandemic, I think, lots of people have found is that that the when every when people in our society have gotten used to online engagement, some of those barriers um, have have been removed, and so it's been really exciting for us to. To think about what we've done in person and then our dialogue events online um time of day is really is something you know sometimes having them during a, a, a the day sometimes having them in the evening um thinking about people's schedules and then having a feedback mechanism right like having those surveys at the end um to, to ask people like did, just all of those questions what were the barriers did you feel included did, did you feel heard what, you know i think learning as you go. Um, and then this, we do a, quite a bit of snowballing, like like who who, who out of your community, who are, who's not at the table and just keep asking like, who should be in this conversation? Um, but it's it's a challenge. And it's an iterative process, it sounds like. Yeah. It's not something you get right all at once. Um, I had a question um, about uh, how it influences science and policy technology, uh, science and technology policy. Sorry. Any examples of where you've seen this kind of two-way engagement have direct impact on science and technology policy? Um, there's a couple of interesting examples. So in the UK, there's ScienceWise, which again, you can Google, and that's kind of policy related. So they um, bring together different panels of people, cross-section of society, and might talk around um, up and coming scientific areas and they sort of get feedback but another really um, lovely example that I heard about ages ago it was happening in Portugal and um, it's it's where they take scientists and and put them in um, sort of the equivalent of the House of Parliament or like yeah where government is um, and just put them in the bar and just get them to talk about sort of up and coming debates because it's it's where politicians don't feel as like um, exposed i suppose they're just having a conversation with a scientist about an important area and i heard about this years ago and it was just one of those things that stuck with me because it's a different example of two-way engagement we always think about it as having to be with you know members of the general public but actually politicians are often they don't they might not have science backgrounds a lot of them in the uk anyway definitely don't um and so yeah thinking about how we can see engagement with other um, sectors is important. It's another example of something we talked about earlier, creating spaces where people can feel comfortable and engage in the conversation. And, and policymakers want, I mean, the, the same kinds of multi-directional conversations we're talking about, about basic science, a lot of policymakers are interested in those convers in, in those conversations as well. Like, what what are different community groups thinking about and talking about? I mean, that's part of their role as politicians. So, anytime you can get decision makers and 
community groups and stakeholders and scientists to engage in a conversation, I think that gets really exciting. I think it, a, a couple of examples, I mean, it's a the direct transfer. I'm trying to think. So one really so, kind of fun story from the ice storm experiment um, through these roundtable dialogues, we, we heard from some of the state decision makers in, in New Hampshire where I live, that they were really interested in the quantification of how much woody debris, how much how many branches fell versus the amount of ice that was sprayed on the trees. And that was just a measurement the scientists were doing. Like they, they weren't that interested in that measurement. It was just part of their study. But the decision makers, the state agency folks were saying, hey, we can use that to help estimate damage from ice storms and then apply for federal aid. And we don't have anything that can help us do that. So your study now can let us do that. So it's not a, a direct policy decision, but it's an example of where a basic study had a component that the scientists didn't know was a value for the people. Thanks. I think this, Greg, I'm going to start this question off with you, if you don't mind. What are you, what, it's a question from Leah. What are your favorite tools or apps for two-way engagement online? And I'll open it up to everyone. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, Twitter. This has kind of been a surprise to me. It took me a while to to jump on that, but it's been really fun to, you know, get the word out there and, you know, people can voluntarily decide to, to listen to you on your soapbox, if you will, uh, and, and engage. So, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, that, that's been really, really fruitful, both scientifically and in terms of, uh, engagement. Um, and then more recently we've been having good success with, uh, uh, the discord platform where you can set up these spaces for people to chat and you know they can do it via you know, essentially text messaging or voice or video uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, dynamic range there um, and, and it's a space where you can set up different rooms for people to engage so they can you know put in their own topics for example we have some standing ones on uh, common ta topics and people can kind of come and go as they they please and uh, uh, exchange information. So that, that's been uh, another you know, really valuable one that uh, has taken off. Thanks. We have time for one last question, I think, from each of you. And I sort of want to end with the future. Um, do, what do you think about this moment coming out of the pandemic, coming out of, of increased awareness of kind of inequity, coming out of increased awareness of global change? Do you think we're going to see an enhanced interest in co-creation and other kinds of two-way communication in science. What do you think the future is? I hope so. And I think it's, you know, up to us to get out there and promote it, right? You know, because, you know, with the pandemic, for example, there's there's a broad range of ways things could go in terms of, you know, people becoming more pro-science because it provided the vaccine so quickly or people being, uh, you know, afraid of it. The more we can, you know, get out there and, you uh, put things, uh, you know, show people the positives and provide them a way to be a part of it and reduce the, you know, fear and anxiety about things they don't understand. Like, I think that has a huge uh, uh, potential for us. I agree. I think obviously there's a huge interest in science at the moment with lots of people looking to science for answers and, and solutions, but also for us to be really human about that as well and say, actually, there's still lots that we don't know. And there's still so much space that, you know, we can welcome people into that conversation and, and make sure their voices are included is really important. Yeah, I, I agree with what's been said. I think it's an important moment. I, I, I hope that um, we start to recognize the importance of having the practitioners who really carry this work forward. If we want to do evidence-informed practices, if we want to be doing this co-creation, it takes full-time people to, to carry that work forward. And I hope that we start supporting that in at the enterprise level of, of our scientific institutions. So thank you. I can't believe we're already out of time. This was this was amazing. You're amazing. One of the one of the audience members and the audience was amazing. What an incredible set of questions. Thank you for contributing so many. One of the Bradley made a comment that thank you, this has made a daunting task seem approachable. So thank you for that. We'll wrap up. I want to invite everybody to the Exchange Connection to continue these conversations and see you at other parts of the conference. Thank you so much.